time for another Film Rescue Quick Pitch. Today on the chopping block, Godzilla 98, directed by Roland Emmerich. Um, Jesse, you have some unfortunate news for the audience as to how much of this movie you watched. I didn't finish it. (laughs) I'd seen it before. I saw it in the theater, actually, when I was, like, 14 or 13. And uh, I remembered it fine, so I was like, yeah, I don't need to finish it. Yeah, it's not like you, it's hard to like remember how it ends. There's a raptor ripoff scene. There's a chase through New York, and then they kill the monster. Yeah, if you if you would call this a side story to Jurassic Park, I would not disbelieve it. That's a lot bigger than a T Rex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so so I have a I have a love hate with this one. I. I think I put this up there with like Roland Emmerich's best movies. I think I like it a smidge more than Independence Day, but only because I think Independence Day wins on star power, whereas this feels like a lot of like really good workman actors just really throwing themselves into making interesting characters. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, mean, I know. I'm alone it, it on really that. It feels overstuffed with as many characters and plot lines that are running through it. It, it it is like the the end of National Treasure when you see the big treasure room. It's just this uh, embarrassment of wealth of excess in the movie. It's it's true. I mean, there's what like four or five subplots running underneath the two main plots. Yeah, I mean, if you want if you want a perfect guy to direct a film about excess, Roland Emmerich, he's your guy. Well, and he also I think really started this whole kind of bullshit overstuffed mega blockbuster thing that yeah. like when's the last when's the last time there was a really good giant blockbuster Mad Max Fury Road There you go. Yeah, and <laughs> that was 5 years ago. I mean aside from a Marvel movie, you know, aside from a Marvel movie. But even even the Marvel movies I feel like do this better by just keeping it to one to two plots. And and maybe that's you know maybe we could get something good out of them who knows but uh, there's I mean there's a plot with the mayor there's a plot with the the news station there's a plot with the army there's a French secret service they totally cut out the Japanese from this story for mm, reasons I guess which is weird because like you see the boat in the opening of this movie and it's filled with all these these famous Japanese actors and I'm thinking why didn't you give them dialogue I mean or and something else to do in the movie you know what i mean like yeah, that's like, uh <laughs> just even like the 2014 movie gave you know ken watanabe something to do right like, and uh, and every good trailer line too that's true that's very true <laughs> yeah i <laughs> i as much as i want to i want this to be a Godzilla movie just because I grew up on it. There was an animated TV show that spun off from this that was decent. Um, the it, It's it's a giant iguana movie is what it is. Yeah, it, if you're going to call it Godzilla, make sure that it actually looks like Godzilla and not like a giant iguana. I mean, <laughs> I, I feel like Roland Emmerich really wants to be Spielberg. There's so many moments in this movie that rip off Spielberg movies like Jaws and Close Encounters and Jurassic Park. Yeah, I mean, the, even like the music sounds a little bit like uh, John Williams' score to Jurassic Park. Yeah, it, it's actually it. It almost sounds a little more like ET to me in places yeah, when it gets a little bit more like ET. It's it, he really wants to be Spielberg and he's really bad at it. Yeah, it's it's it, even to the degree that maybe all these extra characters are his way of because I, I bring this up all the time. You watch a Spielberg movie and a character with two lines still feels like they have a whole rich history. Um, maybe they got away with it because this was New York, but there's uh, there's a lot of characters here and a lot of potential. But then they're they're just kind of like dicking around doing side story stuff like trying to bang each other or you know get having a marriage in fights uh inside of their uh fuck critics metaphor oh yeah and the, the mayor of this movie looks like uh roger ebert and is named to mayor ebert and his assistant is uh looks a lot like gene siskel because <laughs> apparently they didn't like independence day very much and this was uh roland emmerich's way of getting back at them it's like how small is your dick <laughs> right christ <laughs> And uh, it, uh, apparently um, Ebert did give this a like 1.5 <laughs> out of 5. Perfect. <laughs> so you know what? You got what you asked for. Yeah, um, yeah. 
Uh, honestly, out of spite, I mean, and maybe I don't have the journalistic integrity, I would have given it a five just to fuck with him. Just be like, oh no, you f- totally killed it this time, dude. Perfect. <laughs> but but do it with a do it with an asterisk. Yeah. Oh yeah. There you go. <laughs> um yeah, d- d- Emric not He has he has a thing. He has a style. He likes to use it over and over and over again. And he's he's his movies have definitely probably put a lot of money into the pockets of people that do real work on CGI and I I'll appreciate that. I'll I'll put that as a yeah. positive. He he's probably responsible for giving enough work to these people that we got to the technology that we have now with like the um what's the name of the thing they used to film Mandalorian with? Oh, the the um the LED wall. Or yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah, the, the LED screen. Yeah. Yeah. So basically that, it's rear, it's it's rear screen projection. I was just watching a, a a short documentary on that from Vox, and apparently they can do v uh, VFX on the fly, and now they can work with the like um, the uh, gaffers and the um, set designers and things like that. So the v, v VFX department is part of the filming process now, and they're yeah. like, "This is incredible! This is something I've always wanted to be able to do." And so, if if Emmerich had anything to do leading up to that. Even just paying paying these people their money, I'm happy. I guess. Yeah. Even unfortunately, the CGI in this movie is not very good. No. <laughs> oh, it's no, bad. It is not. The whole movie takes place in the rain and at night, but they're spotlighting the damn thing, Be- and like you just double down on your visual effects by like trying to cover up how bad they are, and then you put a spotlight on how bad they are. Right. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> It's it, it clearly wants to be a Jurassic Park because it's it's he runs around like the T Rex. It's it, it almost feels like it's ripping off the 1978 King Kong as well. Oh in a yeah, a lot of places. It just feels like there's no identity of its own. And no. also, Roland Emmerich had a level of contempt for the Godzilla franchise. And when people said like, "Oh, you're gonna do an American Godzilla? Are you gonna have him like?" You know, like the guy in the suit, you know, doing it just like the old Toho films. And they was like, what, you want to go back to doing that? Like, why would you want to do that? He, thinking that everybody saw those movies and thought it w- thought they were bad, not realizing <laughs> that that's the charm of those movies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, he clearly well, did this because he was getting paid, not because he actually really cared. Well, and for uh, anyone that doesn't know, um, you can have a guy in a suit and have it look really, really good. There's a movie called Shin Godzilla, yeah. and it is a straight-up Toho Godzilla man in a suit. But the way they incorporate the the CGI and things into it, it looks fresh. It looks modern. Like it doesn't. There's no wires. You don't see anything like that. So it's not that it's impossible to do it all. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you as, and I think we've reached a point now where if you did another Godzilla film, it'd be better to do it like that because we've reached a point where a guy in a suit can look really good. Yeah, with exactly. With makeup and suits and, you know, camera technology, visual effects technology, you can make it look good. Like, why does it all have to be CGI? Yeah. Well, and... It feels more... It, like, the C in CGI should not stand for crutch. <laughs> right. I I really love a lot of the um like practical effects the giant Godzilla's foot and his teeth cutting into the van and all of those things I really enjoy looking at. I think that that's what and that's where I you, you could tell he's taken a lot of cues from Spielberg. Like he it, Spielberg only put in the full CG T-Rex when he absolutely had to. Yeah. I wonder what Spielberg thought of this movie. <laughs> oh, good question. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe look that up at some point. <laughs> yeah, I, I I would I would be I'd be uh interested to know. Um so so let's fix this jalopy. Um you've got a pretty good pitch and I've got a couple little uh add-ons for it that I think we we got the beginnings of a really good idea here. Uh, number 1, don't set it in New York. <laughs> Just yes. I'm tired of seeing monsters in big cities. Like you got to do something else and set it in a time frame where it's appropriate for this character. Exactly. Yeah, like setting it in like 1940s, 1950s Los Alamos, New Mexico, mm-hmm. that's more appropriate because if you're going to say that like, he's an irradiated creature, putting it in a place where we don't really know the effects of radiation extensively makes more sense. Exactly. If you must Americanize it, that's the place to put it. Right. Yeah, not putting it in New York. And speaking of uh, very classic B movie desert settings, your pick for director uh, kind of like hit two things for me that I really enjoyed. Yeah, uh, Ron Underwood that directed uh, the movie Tremors. 
Because if you want to talk about like B movie being elevated by a decent script and good acting, that's the movie that does it. Exactly. And the year that Godzilla 98 came out, he did Mighty Joe Young and went all the way to the Oscars with it. Yep. Even though the movie didn't make any money. <laughs> no, it did not. I mean, it was it was literally eclipsed by this giant New York destroying movie. And Mighty Joe Young is about like, what if, you know, King Kong was kind of not a monster, but like a good, intelligent, giant ape. Uh, so it's got a, a lot of heart in it. So it, that was like the heartwarming Disney thing to go out underneath of Godzilla 98 that's literally destroying the Chrysler building. And it's like, how is it supposed to compete as another big animal movie? I know, right? And apparently this movie made profit. I, I'm, not yeah. su- I'm not sure why they didn't continue with a with the sequel because they could have, but apparently they didn't. I guess the reviews were just that bad. The reviews were that bad, and then they really got into merchandising. This this movie probably was one of the most merchandised things for me as a kid, to the point that I remember it now. Like that's how much the TV shows and video games and like Burger King was selling toys for it, and just I mean, this got merchandised a lot for a movie that like I wouldn't have been able to been allowed to see in theaters until like five years later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was uh even the right the the remake rights to this film were even though this is a remake the remake rights to this were also purchased by Toho so they could put this version of Godzilla into the other actual Godzilla film Godzilla Final Wars yeah and that version that they just named Zilla shows up for twenty seconds and immediately gets killed <laughs> that's exactly how Toho felt when this film came out they saw it as an insult and yeah. it is pretty much insulting because. There's nothing interesting about Godzilla. Like, it's not, like, commenting on anything. Because Godzilla, the original character, is commenting upon uh, the effects of nuclear destruction. Right. Uh, in in Tokyo. It, th- this this remake isn't really saying anything or is not really, is, is not really about anything. It's just a big monster movie. Yeah, it's not even really interested in saying anything either. It it just it wants to string together sixteen different action beats, some of them literally back to back to back. Yeah. Just to have the excuse of, so is your dick hard now? Like, are you leaving the theater with a nosebleed? Because you better be. Yeah, th- like the film moves so quickly, and the film is two hours and twenty minutes long, and it's, it's it constantly moves, and like the ending set piece of Madison Square Garden is like an hour long, and it just keeps going and going and going. It doesn't stop very often. It's almost no. like your foot is on the accelerator all the time, and you're rambling through traffic. It's right. It just never stops. It it's. It's almost kind of tiresome after a certain point. That's kind of why I dipped out. It was just like I'm so tired of watching it. Yeah, this is um that what you're describing is how I feel when I watch the Transformers movies. I get so over inundated with just things happening that my brain starts to like actually get anxious. I'm like I'm not able to keep track of what's happening on the screen and so I'm starting to feel bad. <laughs> Yeah, you just you st- your brain starts going haywire. Your adrenaline stores up, and you're just kind of like, oh god, can't do it anymore. Like, and every <laughs> single time they just keep upping the ante because they do the same things like three times. Right. The giant pile of fish, where they they lure Godzilla with, like they do that same thing like twice. Right. <laughs> and the the helicopters attacking Godzilla, they do that whole sequence like three times. <laughs> like, if it ain't broke, keep taking a hammer to it. <laughs> right, exactly. Jesus. And just h- swing harder each time. Just get a little, put another harder hit in there, right? Yeah, it, it, it's it's just a frustrating film to watch because it, you needed to have those moments of those, like in Tremors, where they slow down, they take their time, they analyze the, the graboids, they give them a name. Yeah. Yeah, like... The they like the time when they actually give this Godzilla a name in this film, um, they do a joke where Matthew Broderick's ex girlfriend says, It's Gojira, you moron and I'm like, Okay, that seems like they're trying to be endearing, but I feel so annoyed by it that I'm just gonna say it's offensive. Well, it felt like it was him making fun of the crowd that would like love to see Godzilla in theaters again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, don't make fun of the super fans, dude. They're going to be paying like half the bills here. It's good to show contempt for your audience. Just ask Michael Bay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, if I, if I added anything to the pitch, I would love a, 
a villain who is suffering from or suffering from engaging in the um, anti-Japanese ideas that were floating around the U.S. Uh, in the 1940s. And um, like, you know, for anyone who doesn't know our history, we literally put Japanese American citizens into internment camp. We did that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, sadly, we still do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we haven't improved much as a country. So the idea that, and uh, there was Japanese American men and women in our military at the time. So imagine a, a scene where, you know, this like paranoia is setting in on our antagonist character and he takes it out on like the one uh, Japanese American guy on the crew that's out hunting for the Godzilla monster. Yeah. Hey, holy shit, your movie's saying something for a minute. I mean, you don't have to make that the whole crux of the thing, but A, you've established a really good villain, and B, now you're pointing out that like some of the the fear that these racist Americans had towards the Japanese, that was like that played out literally when we nuked them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it has a it have a it would have a message, something to talk about rather than just big monster stomping on city. And that's kind of what the sequels became to the original Godzilla. But you know, you can you can have the candy sequels, but the original has to say something. Exactly. The original exactly. has to be a grounding point. And unfortunately, this being a remake, you have to go back to square one. They didn't add anything. They, yeah. If anything, they took stuff out. Oh, absolutely. I mean, think about the uh, the the original Godzilla movie that is centered around a scientist, which you could argue Matthew Broderick is a, is a scientist in this as well, and he has his little moments. But he's really the he's a action guy in this. He's he's yeah. Sam Neill in the second half of Jurassic Park, or Jeff Goldblum in all of Lost World. Like they turn these scientist characters into these like action heroes to the degree that he literally gets into an army suit. And where's that for the rest of the movie? Yeah, and it, it makes no sense why they would actually even get him anyways. Like, you went all the way to Chernobyl just to get that one guy. There's literally nobody else on the planet that's available. Apparently. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's t- Chernobyl's a long way from where that boat crashed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it just it seems like convenience for the sake of convenience. It's, yeah. It's, Absolutely. They, they, put it in, they put the opening in Chernobyl. But by the way, they have an opening that's in Chernobyl. And they have a sign that says Chernobyl radiation. So it's like, okay, we know it's in Chernobyl. And then the very next shot, it has a Chiron at the bottom that says Chernobyl. <laughs> I just saw the fucking sign! <laughs> right. Oh, God. Like, I hate it when movies do that. Oh, absolutely. I think I think the, the like, decision there was, well, what if people can't read the Russian on the sign that we need to say it again in English, It says right? it in fucking English! <laughs> Yeah, that that's that uh, that's the frustrating little nitpicks on it, but um, you that's, know, basic, that's, the stu- that's the studio believing the audience is dumb. Basically, what you've done here is you've mixed Tremors and Predator. It's about like a, a crew of American soldiers against a a monster out in a in a kind of you know foreign setting. I'm here for it. I think that'd be a great time. Yeah, it's a fun you know monster action adventure film with a message. You you could even open it the same way as Predator and just like show them on one of their missions initially, because like Predator doesn't really kick off until about half hour into it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> no no issues with it. John McTiernan was having a great fucking time out in the jungle making good action scenes. But mm. uh, yeah, well, you could I don't do know something. If he had a great time. It was hot as fuck out there. <laughs> well, yeah, true. <laughs> If you enjoyed this, please subscribe to our channel. Check out some of the videos that will get suggested at the end here. Uh, we really appreciate it if you'd leave a like as well. This is a spinoff from a larger podcast and series of podcasts that Montressor Media runs. You can check all of those out on any podcast streaming apps. The name of the major show is called The Film Rescue Show, where we do basically this over the course of an hour and a half to two hours. Sometimes more, depends on the movie. You can also donate to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Montressor Media. For a dollar, you can get access uh, to all of our podcasts, early access to episodes of this nature, as well as the podcast short films and everything else that we have in the works. We are a, a growing team, and every dollar helps us. We have a goal set right now. If we hit $300 in patron donations, we'll be able to get a studio and start doing this 
live and over Twitch and video versions of everything, which I guess people like better because, hey, that sounds fun. You can also follow me at Seth X Decker, and you can follow Jesse at Hardcore B Shot on Twitter. You can also follow at Film Rescue Show if you'd like to be a part of the main podcast, or if you have a quick pitch, you can send it there or to our email, filmrescueshow at gmail.com. Um, yeah, I, I like this pitch a lot. I'm, I'm very satisfied. We got something to say, at least a little something to say in our B movie, monster movie. Yeah. It sounds good to me. I like it. Well, that's going to do it for us. Thank you for listening to another one of these. And uh, I've been your pitch master, General Seth. And I've been Jesse. Thank you for listening, and good night. Good night. Good night.